It is going to be a long video, but this manga deserves my full attention and I don't want to cut any corners. I think this is the first time I feel overwhelmed making a video mainly because of the vast scope of this series and how much I love this manga. On my MD Guys video I mentioned that Dragon Quest The Adventure of Dai is my favorite shonen story of all time, but to be fair, I'm not a big shonen fan as I only love two. The first Dragon Ball anime, just the first one, and Hunter x Hunter. And yes, I watched all the usual suspects over the years, and I did not hate them, but I did not fall in love with them either, I just forgot about them quickly, unlike The Adventure of Dai. But before I start talking about the manga, I need to talk about two things, how I knew the anime adaptation and my history with Dragon Quest. Where I live, there are two types of JRPG fans back in the 80s and 90s, the Final Fantasy fans and the Dragon Quest fans. I was a Dragon Quest fan. My first introduction with the series is with Dragon Quest V on the Super Famicom in late 1993. And because of it, Dragon Quest became one of, if not my favorite JRPG series. And to this day, the Super Famicom games are the pinnacle of the series in my opinion, with Dragon Quest 3 being my favorite in the series. Franchise clicked with me. I love the anime aesthetic, the stories that make me feel I'm on a hero's journey, always gives me that cozy, comfortable feeling. And it was the first game series that made me fall in love with this music. Now for the anime adaptation of The Adventure of Dai. This anime aired on TV in my country in 1998, and I will never forget that day. It was after school, having lunch, and the opening started playing on TV. At first I did not know it was Dragon Quest related as the name of the anime's dub was changed to Die the Brave, and when the episode started, I was astounded. This is the Dragon Quest music, this is the same art, the same monsters. What is this? And my late uncle told me that this is a manga based on the Dragon Quest series, a separate story, and this is its anime adaptation. And oh boy, I fell in love with this anime. All of my Dragon Quest feelings emerged and watching an anime based on a video game never felt perfect for me ever since I saw the Street Fighter 2 the animated movie. The anime had its fair share of problems though, like slow pacing and the flashback syndrome, but you know what? That did not bother me at all. I still love the anime to this day. The art is fantastic for the most part. The musical arrangements are my favorite in the Dragon Quest series. There is a decent amount of blood which is satisfying for a gorehound like me. The action scenes are fun to watch but not always and that's fine it wasn't a hindrance for me. And it was faithful to the manga until the last episode. And this is what stopped this anime from being the best of its kind in my eyes. The story is not complete as it did not adapt the full manga with a kinda original ending, which I'll go in depth with in the spoiler section. I always say if I were a billionaire, I would help fund three anime adaptations. A full Crossbone Gundam anime, a full Giver adaptation if the manga ever finishes, as an animated movie or OVA series with the same tone as the classic OVA. And finally, a complete adaptation of The Adventure of Dai, animated at Studio Madhouse. <sighs> a man can dream. So, I was bummed about it for years as I always wanted to know the entire story, until my uncle got me the whole manga series in the early 2000s. And let me tell you, I never hugged someone so hard in my life. My uncle, along with my father and big brother, were significant influences on me when it comes to video games, anime, and horror movies. My uncle was part of the anime industry in my country as he worked on many anime dubs in the late 70s till the early 90s. My father was a huge Gundam fan ever since its inception. My big brother was all of that along with buying anime video games ever since the Famicom. I also got the luxury of reading a complete long shonen manga, something a lot of people take for granted, as these type of stories rely a lot on cliffhangers with its battles. So I consider myself lucky reading the entirety of this manga knowing that I don't need to wait for a new chapter. Anyway, so because of my uncle, I fell in love with reading manga. I used to read manga but not on the same level of enjoyment as watching anime, but after reading The Adventure of Dai, 
it all changed, and when I finished reading it, it became my favorite shonen manga of all time and my most loved Dragon Quest story. I won't be talking about the Dragon Quest series as a whole, there are enough channels that do that and I can never top them. So here is a brief background of the Dragon Quest games. All main games created by Yuji Horii at Enix, now Square Enix. The first game came out on the Famicom in 1986, and the series is still going strong. Almost every game follows its own story except for the original trilogy. It is one of the pioneer game series that helped flourish and inspire the JRPG genre. All character and monster designs made by Akira Toriyama, the creator of Dragon Ball, and Koichi Sugiyama composes all the music. The soundtrack of the series remains the same with added stuff here and there. So with this trinity of unique people, Dragon Quest remains consistent to this day and never forget its origin. So now with the manga, Dragon Quest The Adventure of Dai is a separate standalone Dragon Quest story. The manga started as a one-shot and it is the first two chapters, but apparently the demand was there to produce a few more, and eventually saw a full serialization from 1989 to 1996 with a total of 349 chapters compiled in 37 volumes, and these are the ones I have. The manga is written by Riko Sanjo, who wrote the screenplay for MD Geist and the original classic Gai King, and created the underrated manga Beat the Vandal Buster. The illustrator is Koji Inada, who also collaborated with Mr. Sanjo on Beat the Vandal Buster. He captures Akira Toriyama's designs, and it is crucial for this manga. Toei produced the anime adaptation in 1991 with a total of 46 episodes, and the anime spawned three films that are original story. Koichi Sugiyama composed the music for the anime, a natural choice. He is the king of anime music, the leading composer for the Dragon Quest series. This is going to be hard because the story is so big, so I'm going to summarize the first 14 chapters, which is the first 8 episodes of the anime. They are basically the introduction arc, but it'll still be considered a massive spoiler because a colossal twist happens at the beginning of the story. A long time ago, the world was engulfed in terror at the hands of the Demon King. Then a legendary hero appeared and defeated the Demon King along with his companions and thus all the monsters that were under the Demon King's spell were lifted, and they became their original peaceful self. A lot of these monsters are now living in an island called Dermalin, but there is a little boy who lives with them, and his name is Dai, a naive little boy who dreams of becoming a hero. You see, Dai was abandoned on a boat when he was a toddler, and the mage Brass, the island's elder, raised him. The first few chapters follows Dai's adventures as he stops greedy people attacking the island, rescuing his friends, and making new ones like Princess Leona, at the same time building the mystery of the dragon symbol that appears on his forehead whenever he loses control, which makes him an unstoppable warrior. So one day, the monsters on the island are becoming violent, and various others are appearing in the rest of the world attacking the cities, hinting at the fact that the Demon King is back. So Princess Leona's family, the Papnika family, gives a quirky, happy weirdo a task, to go to Dermalin Island and train Dai because she believes he's the next true hero that will save the world. The person with said task is called Evan, the hero teacher. So Evan sails to Dermalin Island with his apprentice Pop, the mage, to train Dai and he needs to do it fast. During the training, Brass is suspicious of Evan because his powers are beyond what a normal person should be. He's way too powerful in his eyes to be a normal teacher. Then a tragedy happened. In the middle of the training, the demon king, called Hedler, arrived at Dremelin Island. And that's when the first twist happens. It turns out that Evan is the legendary hero that defeated Hedler 15 years ago. Then another twist occurred. That an even more powerful being revived Hedler in the first place. The demon emperor Varn. Battle ensues between Evan and Hitler, and Hitler is destroying Evan. Knowing that this will be his final battle, Evan puts his students under a spell to make their bodies hardened and can't move, and told them that this is a farewell, and gave them his graduation necklaces. A very emotional scene, and he wanted the kids to eventually defeat Varn while he kills Hitler right now. 
That scene shows how Avan is a real hero. He remains happy and positive till the very end. And eventually, he sacrifices his life to kill Hitler. In that brief moment, I had an emotional reaction. Avan is dead, but he killed the villain of his time and is up to die to defeat the villain of his time. But then a third twist happened. Hitler did not die. When I watched that, I screamed like a baby while my mom smacked me in the head to shut up and yelled, Act your age! I did shut up, I did not act my age. Anyway, so Dai is getting out of control and the dragon mark appears. And Hedler says this is the symbol of the dragon knight. And Dai almost killed the weaking Hedler until his eventual escape. With this, Dai leaves Drimlin Island and his adventure begins to stop the evil forces from destroying the world, meeting new friends, mentors and enemies in this vast rich world. To say that this is the story is a huge understatement. It is a fraction of what the story is really about, and it gets more prominent by the chapter. The beginning chapters I just talked about are fantastic as it felt like the story was at its climax. It is the perfect setup to a large chain of events that are coming. More villains appear that worked above and under Hitler, more twists and turns until the very last chapters. Betrayals and switching sides, fights that makes you think it will end in a traditional way, and then it detonates an explosion of shocking events. Especially in the second half of the story, where a never ending roller coaster of surprises keeps on hitting. A lot of revelations when unveiled, it makes a second reading feel like a completely different experience. The sad part is that the story becomes grander after the events of the anime. And during my entire reading, I was crying from the inside because it becomes insane up until the end. Does it have all the shonen cliches? Well, yes, of course. And that's not always a bad thing. It's all about the execution and it is perfect for my taste. Yes, the story on the surface has the standard conflict of good versus evil in an old-fashioned way. Sometimes simpler is better for me. But it does go into unpredictable territories with an ending that is kinda different for the genre and left me in bittersweet tears, which I'll talk later in the video in the spoiler section. As for the world, it is vast and filled with history and lore, and nothing unleashes my escapism more than good world building. There are four continents and seven kingdoms, and they are the Land River Continent, which has the Romas Kingdom, the Holkia Continent, which has the Paprika Kingdom, the Malnora Continent, which has the Orzam Kingdom, the Guildmain Continent, which has four kingdoms, the Lingaya Kingdom, the Karl Kingdom, the Bengarna Kingdom, and the Terran Kingdom. And finally, at the bottom, there is Dermilan Island, and at the top, the Field of Death. All of those places I mentioned have significance in the story, and it's just the overall picture of the world. There are more villages, islands, and secrets, and the more exploration of the world happens, I get sucked in even more, just like the games. No JRPG franchise gets me sucked in in its world as much as the Dragon Quest series, and this manga is no different. The tone of the story is balanced, it is light-hearted when it needs to be, it is tear-jerking in the right moments, and the battles are fast and does not take 1000 chapters to finish, but not too fast. It's so like I said, everything is balanced. It is one of those stories that I love every character. All types of personalities are present, from very lovable to very hateful. Memorable main characters with a huge cast of villains and supporting characters and everyone is fundamental to the plot. So it is hard for me to choose which characters I should focus on. Therefore, I'm going to talk about a lot of characters. The little boy from Dermalin Island, Dai, the story's main character. What can I say about this legendary character? I think he is one of the most lovable kids ever written. He is naive but not an idiot, and his bravery is something to behold. But his power is his purity. Throughout the story, you never forget that he is a kid, no matter how threatening the situation is. The innocent personality of his never leaves. And saying that is not a bad thing because he doesn't have that I'm um, innocent so it's okay for me to be annoying character trait. He's not the type that acts like an idiot and only becomes serious when the situation is. He has an overwhelming sense of love, but in a very subtle way. 
He's always chill whenever there are no battles, humble, eager to learn, and embraces the world that he's in, much like any player who falls in love with the Dragon Quest game. His continuous growth is what it is, it's gradual, it's smooth and natural so you don't notice it, as if you are growing up with him. He is discovering this world just like you, the reader, and by the end of the story you will have no choice but to love the little hero. An important thing about Dai to me is that he is not the underdog. His power is impressive from the beginning because of his origin, but he is clueless about it and his growth mainly focuses on his personality and discovering himself. The real underdog of the story is Pop, the cowardly mage from Lankark's village in the Guildmain continent. I hated him in the beginning, as I should be. At first he is a jerk every time an enemy appears always flee from battles and leaving his comrades behind. He never shuts up about how he is afraid and coming up with excuses to not face the enemy. He is not a skillful magician and always the laughing stock. Then slowly rises to the occasion as he surprises the characters and the reader with his unpredictable bravery. I connect with Pop more because he is as ordinary as you can get. Almost everyone in this story has a special background, courageous, and never afraid of the enemy, except for Pop. So when he faces his fears, his courage becomes something more meaningful because you saw him as a coward. You know he is facing something stronger than him. That's why he is the character with the most courage in the story. He is the true king of braves. Step away, guy. His training chapters are my favorite, better than dies in my opinion. He steals the spotlight in critical battles when he surprises the people around him with a new skill, giving you that underdog achievement that proved everyone wrong. He is the influencer to essential characters without him noticing it, and eventually becomes like his teacher Avon, a person that would never hesitate to sacrifice his life to save his friends, especially Dai. And speaking of his relationship with him, it's beautiful. Over the course of the story, Pop becomes the older brother figure for Dai, protecting and watching over him. Even though Dai is more powerful than him, he would never survive without Pop. This also supports the fact that I mentioned before, not forgetting that Dai is just a little kid. Pop reminds us of that when he takes care of him, and he knows that he is nowhere near the level of Dai when it comes to power. That's why he is protective of him, to secure the fate of the world by preventing Dai's death no matter what. He reminds me a lot of Sam from Lord of the Rings. If it's any other manga or anime, he would be the main character. He fits all the criteria for an underdog tale. I always root for him, and that is why he is my favorite character in this manga. The last of the leading trio, Mom, the physically dominant girl from Nail Village in the Land River continent. She is Avan's student who graduated way before Dai and Pop. Her parents were legendary heroes and the companions of Avan when they were young. In the beginning, she uses a magic gun and eventually becomes a fighter as she discovers her raw physical powers. She is as brave as Dai from the start, and just like Pope, when she's around Dai, you feel like she's his big sister, and thus you feel like Pope and Mom are Dai's guardians or something. She's very compassionate towards her friends, more like a giver. At first you feel like something is missing with her character, but then she goes into this metamorphosis later on in the story and I loved it. Really fleshed her out and showed her true potential. Leona, the princess of the Papnica kingdom. At first I thought Leona is just a side character, but during the story I realized that she is as vital as mom and Pope. She is Dai's first interest basically. He is infatuated by her and from the day they met, he wants to protect her. She is responsible for Dai's first awakening of the dragon symbol and to one of its essential upgrades. She was with him in his first important battle and stood by his side in his final one. The way I see it is that Leona is Dai's childhood love. It's so pure and innocent. Another element in the story that shows Dai's inner child. She is a free spirit and the annoying matchmaker, and one of the best healers in the world. Although not a student of Avan, she can pass as one easily. 
Avan, the legendary hero, the main reason for all the main character's development in the story. He's the pillar of the plot in my opinion. He's always happy, smiling in the face of danger, and unbelievably optimistic. His impact on the main characters and the world remains present until the very end. He remains a crucial element to the plot's progression and that is very impressive writing-wise. The characters kept on learning from him even after his death, and every time you think they learned enough, they discover new things. It's as if he's watching over everybody in their journey, making sure that they will succeed. He is the most lovable teacher master in all of manga and anime. Yes, that's a big statement, but that's how I feel. He's also responsible for one of the most significant shocking moments in the story. More on that on the spoiler section. He is a legendary hero because his love for everybody is something beyond explanation. And smiling is the only response I have whenever I think of him. He is the combination of all the main characters. The giver, the courageous, the warrior, and the pure hearted. No hero is worth loving without a villain worth hating, and the good news, there are tons of them in the story. They are different, some of them hate each other, almost all of them have different goals. Having different types of villains on the same side is one of my favorite elements in storytelling because you will never know what would happen between them, and that is how I felt with this story. It really feels like that they are a ticking time bomb, it's always tense whenever they are around each other. I will talk briefly about them though, as knowing less about them the better. The Highest Authority, the Demon Lord Varn. It's hard talking about him without any spoilers, everything about this character is a secret, even his face. He hides behind a veil most of the time until his eventual reveal. He is the chess master, the evil being that is controlling everything without the knowledge of his underlings. His malevolent personality is on another level. Even some of the villains are shocked by how twisted he is. On top of that, there is no ass pull final villain. From the beginning, the story sets you up as Varn being the ultimate evil. One way or another, it's always Varn. Hadlar, the leader of the demon army, who works directly under Varn, or so he thinks. I love Hadlar. He starts off as this cocky, arrogant jerk, always underestimating his enemies, being reckless all the time, and the result? Being defeated most of the time, which changed him eventually. His emotions get the best of him and always in a conflict to be a good warrior for Varn, and so he develops more as a serious adversary as if his defeats humbled him in a way. His character development is flawless and handled with care, and just like the main characters, he kept on growing and learning until he flourished as a fantastic villain, and his tug of war with Dai was the icing on the cake. I can't talk more about him, so I'll save it for the spoiler section. So under Hadlar, there are six generals, each one is unique and different, and they are the following. First one is Crocodine, the leader of the beast army. He focuses on physical strength, he follows the rule of an honorable warrior, doesn't trick his enemies and thrives on having fair fights. He starts off as hateful and ends up as huggable. He has a phoenix type of transformation that changed him completely. The leader of the sorcerer's army is a boyar, a sleazy scientist with a cowardly tactics and loves to cheat and trick his enemies to gain victory. Basically the opposite of Crocodine. He is Hadler's henchman as he updates him on current events through spying and backstabbing. He is my least favorite character though because he was more on the annoying side and he became boring later on. Flezart, the leader of the Ice and Flame army, one of the more sinister villains in the manga, and the coolest looking one. He is a life form that is created by Hadler, and so he has some of his characteristics. He is cocky and loves to torture his enemies for fun, he doesn't mess around and always finds pleasure in inflicting pain to others. His story arc is one of the most critical arcs as it acts as a transition to the next stage of the story. The leader of the dragon army Baran, who is from his first reveal, Flazard and Zaboira were intimidated by his power and achievements. That's how you introduce a compelling villain, make the other villains afraid of him. He's always collected and acts as the perfect soldier. His build up is excellent, he's being teased to fight over and over again, but still gets delayed, until his eventual debut and it paid off. His story is one of the most emotional ones, and just like Crocodine, I ended up loving this character so much. 
If I say anything more about him is a major spoiler, so let's just move on to the next villain. Hunikil, the leader of the immortal army, who has the coolest weapon that stuck with me over the years, the Amado. It's a sword that transforms into his armor and the sword becomes like a whip. A unique weapon, that's for sure. You know what is also cool? His skeleton army. I have a soft spot for skeleton armies, I can't help it. And just like Baran, he has one of those touching origin stories. What makes him different from all the generals is that he was a former student of Avan. His first student, actually. Yes, that was a shock, but it's not per se as they didn't build it up or anything. It was revealed when he showed up for the first time. Thus, he becomes the first dilemma for Diana's friends and they must overcome it. His story is filled with sorrow, going from being raised by a skeleton warrior to Avan and eventually by Mist Varn, the leader of the Shadow Army. A perfect way to describe him is mysterious. He doesn't show his face and doesn't speak as he is always silent, but whenever he does, you know it's a big deal. Also, his silence is related to the ultimate truth, believe it or not. Out of all the generals, he has the eeriest vibe to him. He seems to be Varn's right hand man. He is never afraid of anyone, and you believe that he is stronger than all of the villains. He is the most loyal to Varn and the closest to him, hence the name, Mist Varn. His identity is my favorite mystery of the story. Every time he shows up, I know something terrible is going to happen. He always spouts hints and cryptic messages that feels like a jigsaw puzzle. And as the smoke clears about who he is, that's what reminds me why I love this story so much. And goes back to what I said, that the second readings are a completely different experience. It's mainly because of Mist Varn. I'll discuss him in the spoiler section, of course. Finally, we have the endless amount of supporting characters, and they are a lot. Every category of characters is present, from cute to perverse to braves to cowards. They all share one thing, and that is making the main protagonists and antagonists look better while retaining their ground. All of these characters serve the story, and they are crucial to its progression. Everyone is essential, even Gome, the golden metal slime, Dai's childhood friend. Gome is responsible for a twist that made my brain explode, and has the saddest moment in the story. Another spoiler section tease! Gome is the most adorable character in the manga, and if you hate him, might as well join the demon army. Now this part is overwhelming for me. Where do I start with any Dragon Quest art? You need a series of videos just talking about the designs of the series. So I'm going to simplify it here. First of all, the classic designs of the monsters in the world. Is it faithful to the games? Yes! All the iconic monsters are present, and they feel like they came out of the games as it should be. Now for the original designs for this manga. Does it fit the Dragon Quest look? Definitely. All the designs can comfortably fit in a Dragon Quest game, and to be perfectly honest, some of them are the best in the series. Flazar's character design is mind-blowing. Everyone I knew back then loved how Flazard looks. From his first reveal, you realize how epic looking he is. The human character designs are similar to a lot of Akira Toriyama's designs, but Koji Inada injected his touch that made them his own. The transformations of some of the villains are brilliant, you can't help but gush at them. The same thing goes for the world. The manga nailed the JRPG immersion of the cities and villages, and that made me connect with all the surroundings and invest in a world that is compelling to know more about. That is the power of subtle art. The battles look spectacular and not once where I was confused on what is going on. It was crystal clear, engaging and exciting. Sometimes I stop reading and appreciate some of the panels as they look like a beautiful work of art. It is stuff like this that I don't think it can be transformed into an anime. It needs to be like that, not a moving animation. I've been building up this spoiler section, haven't I? There are six major spoilers I will talk about if you kept count. I'm not going to talk about everything of course, but I will discuss the things that stood up to me. So this is for the people who watched the full anime and read the entire manga. 
First, let's talk about the anime ending. It is an original ending like I mentioned before. It is a tiny change, but it is so important it may have caused a butterfly effect if the anime kept on going with it, which is further proof that the studio did not plan to continue the anime, contrary to my younger self who was waiting for a sequel like an idiot. So the anime ended on chapter 88, and it was all fine and canon until the last three pages of that chapter. It changed when Baron wanted to remove Dai's memories. In the anime, he did not succeed and retreated, but in the manga, he did accomplish that and escaped because he depleted all of his energy. That is a significant change as the events leading up to it contains a lot of revelations to Dai's origin, Pop dying and getting back to life, Unikill getting a new armor, all of that will not be possible if Dai kept his memories. It is evident that the studio wanted to finish the anime on a happy note instead of the somber one in the manga, but might as well end it with the previous arc with Flazard. That arc ended with a glorious victory for the main characters, and it was climactic, and the anime would have been entirely canon till the end. Instead, they cut it off in the middle of an arc with a non-canon original ending. Now for the four most shocking moments that impacted me while reading the manga. Number 1. Hadler's complete 180 in his personality, becoming a true warrior, fair and want a real final battle with Dai with no interruptions, sacrificing his life to gain the ultimate body with the help of Zaboira. Now this I did not see coming. His development reached a complete circle and when Dai defeated him and Kilvarn interfered, I was so angry like screaming internally let him have his final moment. But then who came to the rescue? That's a number two. And it is Avan. Yes, he was alive and my emotions were all over the place. Having the necklace from Flora saving his life and going through intense training made so much sense. He knew he was weak so getting stronger is the only option and that's why he didn't tell anybody to avoid being a hindrance. That is so often. I was just like Pop at first, in denial and about to cry. He is a perfect character and his warmth and love gave me the biggest sigh of relief. It was perfect. Number 3. Miss Varn Identity Talk about perfect writing. Miss Varn is Varn, but not really. You see, Varn is an old demon, and when Miss Varn showed himself for the first time, he looked very similar to Varn. At first I thought he was a young Varn with time travel stuff, but nope. He is a shadow-like creature called Mist. A long time ago, Varn split his body into two. Mist took one body to protect it to keep it fresh, so Mist is a glorified freezer, while Varn remains in the other half, the aging body, while getting more experience and knowledge, and one day he will get the young body back when he is ready. This build-up makes so much sense if you reread the manga. Every line Miss says becomes clear after knowing the truth. That is why he barely talks, because of the similar voice to Varn. That is why he is always with Varn. It was his body, and his confidence when he thinks he is stronger than everybody makes perfect sense. And when we knew the full secret, Varn immediately took over his young body and my brain couldn't handle all these shocking moments. They were happening so fast. It's incredible. Number 4. Gome, Dai's childhood friend, who has my favorite twist in the story, and my most tear-jerking moment. From time to time you see Gome helping Dai and his friends with silly attacks on enemies, but sometimes he does questionable magic through crying that is primarily miracles. And that's what they were, miracles, I'm not kidding. In the final fight, Varn freaked out and snatched Gome from Leona and said that this is the tear of God. Then Varn squishes and kills Gome. And I was like, poor Dai, give him a break! And then he went into this illusion with Gome and he explained everything to Dai. When the gods became sad about how weak the world is, they shed a tear, and this tear comes to the world and grant wishes. So when Dai first met Gome apparently, he was a tear, and Dai's wish was to be his friend, and thus he took the form of the golden metal slime. So as Gome is saying his goodbye, 
He told Dai that he would return as a tear in a decade, but he will not remember anything from his past life, just the knowledge of it. Seeing Gome cry and not wanting to go is hands down the saddest moment in the manga. As he went away, he granted Dai's final wish, to let the world know the current situation which eventually helped save the world. Gome saved the world! I love this story! Finally, let's talk about the ending of the manga. After Dai's win over Varn, amazing final form by the way, everything seems fine and dandy, but then Kill Varn appears. I don't want to talk about him, but in brief, he works for Velther, the dragon king of the demon world who is the rival of Varn his job to assassinate Varn when he has the chance, hence his name Kill Varn. So, when he was going to detonate a black core, a large-scale dangerous bomb, Dai sacrificed himself to save everybody. It happened so fast and it did not register in my head, and the next page shows some weeks have passed and no one can find Dai, but he is alive since his sword is glowing, and the characters know that one day he will appear again, and the story ends. I love the ending, but it has issues. I wanted a more extended epilogue. After a long story, I think it's only fair to have one epilogue chapter. I wanted more closure with the rest of the characters. As for Dai, Lomberg says he is either in Makai, the demon world, or Tenkai, the heaven world. And so he's alive? It's not clear. But if Lomberg is correct, that means that Dai is fighting or trying to find his way back home. And judging by the final pages, showing how the world is peaceful and filled with love, the world will welcome Dai with open arms and not be afraid about the fate of his father Baron. And the vibe gives you that optimistic feeling that he will definitely return. That's why I have no problem with how they concluded things with Dai. The ending has the same spirit as the Gumbuster ending, so no complaints here. If I desire to see what happens to Dai in pages, I only want one scene, have the last page be a 10 year time skip and showing a grown up Dai back to his world but he is in a forest, giving the vibe that he is searching for something for a long time. And then you see the tear of God and have the last line be, would you be my friend. The tear glows as it covers the final panel in white and it ends. To me that would be perfect. But with the writing of the story and knowing Dai, you know these things will happen. You don't need to show it. That's why I don't have a problem with the ending in that I love it. It's bittersweet at first, but with time it became beautiful. When I first started this channel, my primary goal was one thing which is talking about anime and video games that are important to me on a personal level. I did that with my Lotus Marathon, and Dragon Quest The Adventure of Dai is the same. It was a significant part of my childhood and how it reminds me that my family was an influence when it comes to the things I love. This manga is my favorite shonen manga, and I can't be more confident to say that. It hits home with me in everything, the story lives up to the Dragon Quest name, and I know there are things I didn't mention, but that's how I feel every time I finish a video. I generally don't see myself as a very critical person, and I don't tell people what to watch or read. My job here is to share my own experience and it has always been wonderful with this manga. Is everything I love about it based on nostalgia? Yes. Is it based on a personal experience? Yes. Is it because the Dragon Quest games are my favorite JRPG series? Yes. But you know what? That's fine. In any form of entertainment, either it's movies, anime, books, video games, I go to the things that makes me feel good, either it's nostalgia, good writing, or personal bias. As long as it triggers my happy thoughts and speaks my inner language, if that makes any sense, then those mediums will be worth it and I will talk about it. And this manga had it all for me. Beautiful story, art, characters that make me smile, and nostalgia.